This is the first session uh, of the second day, and uh, it's called Legal Challenges uh, for New Organizational Models. Um, we have uh, three papers. Um, which uh, nicely linked to the uh, general topic of the conference um, on the pandemic and the long-term effects on uh, labor law. Uh, to which extent uh, our three papers actually uh, contribute to a discussion of new models or new organizational models we have to see and maybe can establish in the, in the uh, uh, discussion afterwards. Um, the paper the papers are neatly linked um, by having a common focus on remote work and its uh, implications for labor law. And uh, I don't want to comment much on, on this topic uh, at the beginning and we have then more time for discussion of the topic. Therefore, let's start with the first speaker, uh, Tami uh, Katsabian from Tel Aviv. Yes, thank you very much. Um, and her paper on telework um, and how COVID has uh, exposed, um, in particular, issues of uh, privacy. Okay, okay Tami. Great, thank you. Yours. So thank you very much for the organizing committee and all the brave people who came so early in the morning. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, the implications of uh, telework on the right to privacy. All the data that I refer to uh, is from the US. The situation, as you'll see in a minute, in the US is very different from the situation in Israel and in Europe, uh, in the bad sense. Um, let's start with some very basic definitions. I, I, I assume that you're all aware uh, to what uh, telework, telework means, but just to be on the same, uh, on the same page. Telework, hybrid work, remote work basically means that the employee is working outside of the, of the workplace using electronic devices. Most of the time we talk about the private electronic devices of the employee, but not necessarily. Telework from home, remote work, which combines working from home, hybrid work from home, uh, refer to employee who works from home. And all the data that I refer to refers to those kinds of uh, employees. Uh, so telework was with us well before the pandemic has started, but of course the pandemic dramatically increased the number of uh, teleworkers all around the world. And this trend is going to stay with us uh, even after the pandemic is over. So according to an OECD research from November 2020, they said, uh, they argued there that the working from home is shifting from being a niche, a temporary phenomenon to becoming a large share of population's permanent way of conducting work. Uh, on July 2021, they published an article another article showing that both employees and employers would like to continue uh, teleworking in a greater way uh, after the pandemic is over. Microsoft in 2021 defined telework as the next great disruption uh, in society and asked whether we are ready. And finally, MIT uh, defined remote work as one of the 10 breakthrough technologies for 2021. So telework has a lot of positive, of course, implications for society, otherwise we won't embrace it. But um, as I try to argue in, argue in, in my research, and I wrote three uh, different articles about it, um, telework creates some sort of a hybrid, innovative hybrid uh, uh, sphere, which combines both the professional and the private sphere of the employee with all the logic, structure, um, environment of both the private and the professional. This has vast implications on the right to equality and the right of and, and working time questions. I will not refer to those questions. I dealt with them in other uh, research. Today, we'll focus on the right to privacy, and again, uh, on the right to privacy in the US. So I want to talk about the right to privacy and uh, the implications of telework on the right to privacy. We first need to, take a, take, to, to remember two things. First of all, in today's world, and again, we are all aware to that, technology, AI technology specifically, uh, create a big threat on the right to privacy. Employers can easily access vast amount of information, every tiny piece of information on the employee, analyze it, and to this, and this creates some sort of uh, normalizing uh, uh, the culture of surveillance in the workplace. And to this, we need to add uh, COVID-19. During COVID-19, we are all monitored by the states in order to make sure that the, the coronavirus is not spreading. And this again normalized the idea of, uh, of uh, surveillance, of monitoring people in their private spheres. Um, 
And to this, we need to add the fact that once an employee is working from home, along with the technological and cultural trends that we are facing today, the employer has a, a real incentive, a real uh, legitimate incentive in a way, to make sure that she's actually working from home, to monitor her, to make sure that she's working and not spending this time on other things. Unlike in the workplace, in which it's more easy to ensure that the worker is actually working because we share the same space, we can enter our office, etc. And of course, there are also uh, cybersecurity risks when the employee is dealing with uh, um, uh, financial uh, information of the clients or, or very, uh, I don't know, uh, top secret information of the company. It makes sense for the company to uh, monitor this information. As you will see in a minute, all the programs that I will refer to don't really deal with the question of cybersecurity. They mainly aim uh, supposedly to ensure that the, working is, the worker is actually working, but in practice, mainly to scare the workers. So what I'm talking about. So uh, from the beginning of the pandemic, several programs such as not only Time Doctor, Terminate, Hubstaff, Pregly, increased dramatically their sales uh, in the US. And what those programs do, there is some sort of escalation in what they are doing. Time tracking is kind of easy. GPS and location tracking. It means that once I install um, the program in my computer or my uh, cell phone, the employer can easily know where I am, whether I'm at, I'm at home or in another place. Taking random screenshots of the worker's computers. This basically means that every once in a while, five minutes, 10 minutes, three hours, there is a, screen, a random screenshot of my computer. And then we can get to a situation in which, for instance, I was working for, I don't know, five hours, during those five hours, there were not screenshots. And then after five hours of work, I wanted to check my bank account for one minute. And there is a screenshot in that exact moment uh, on, this, uh, on, on my private bank account. So two things happened at that moment. First of all, the employer thinks that what I was doing dur during the all five hours was dealing with my private uh, issues. And second, the employer is exposed to this data. This data is also analyzed by AI technology, but the employer can also have access to this data. The more uh, progressive program do video recording of the worker screen. So every couple of minutes, 10 minutes, but not necessarily, there is a video recording. The employer can actually see what I was doing on my screen or to see me with my family members at the background, um, etc. Monitoring all on the online and offline activity of the employee means all the websites, all the email, all the pages that I was visiting during the day, what I was doing in each and every page for how long, it is, it is all being analyzed by the AI technology. And all the, uh, the things that I was doing offline, all the documents that, are, that were open on my uh, computer. Uh, and finally, uh, referring to those explicit uh, monitoring programs, probably the last one, uh, the last program, it's a, it's, a, it's a new program, it changed it, its names also lately, uh, uh, offer to create an interactive uh, community when people work at home and how they do so. They create avatars for each, each and every uh, employee. And if I want to interact with someone, all I need to do is just to click on the employee avatar and then automatically I can see the face and hear the voice of the employee. Uh, this basically enables us supposedly to create the same environment as we have in the workplace. I can just enter the office of my, uh, my colleague. But, tech, but practically what it says is that uh, I, as an employee, are encouraged, are actually forced to keep the, the camera and the uh, microphone always open. And in a minute, every colleague of mine, my employer can see what I was doing, what I'm doing in that specific moment, and to hear uh, whether I'm screaming at my, at my child or something like that. So those are the explicit uh, monitoring program, but along with them, there are all the supposedly innocent uh, working programs, such as Microsoft 365, three, yeah, 365, which aggregates all sorts of data into simple charts or graphs that give managers high level view of what workers are doing. So I'm using those programs to work, but there, there are also some sort of uh, secret, uh, uh, secretly monitoring what I'm doing. So I want to provide three specific examples uh, of those monitoring, uh, what those monitoring programs actually do in practice in order to, I think, explain better uh, the meaning to the right to privacy of teleworkers in the US. So NBC News, there are many articles about it, just two. NBC News published an article in August 2021 uh, they showed in this article how uh, they have many interviews with big tech teleworkers and they show how the, those teleworkers face pressure to accept uh, home surveillance that include 
monitoring by AI powered cameras in workers' home, voice analytics and storage of the data collected from workers' family members, including minors. This basically means that those teleworkers are uh, forced, required to sign a contract in which they agree that all the information that was collected, including at their home by the camera, including information about minors or minors, will be exposed to the employer. The same article shows how ridiculous it can be. Uh, one of the uh, teleworkers uh, said that she was forced, uh, she was required to um, install a camera in her working space. She, she has a very small home. And we're talking about equality, so it's related to the question of equality. She has a very small home, so she uh, installed the camera in her uh, bedroom because she was working in her bedroom usually during the evening, at night, because she had another job during the day. And then she said that the camera and the microphone in the bedroom was uh, on. She had to lock them on when she was working at night. And the camera mostly uh, take a picture of her working and then her husband sleeping and snoring. So it takes us to a very ridiculous uh, situation. And finally, an article from the beginning of the pandemic from May 2020 by Adam Satariano, is a UK reporter uh, of the New York Times. He's located in the UK. Uh, he agreed to uh, participate freely in experiment in which he uh, installed one of the program hub stuff on his computer. And I will not describe the entire article. It's a fascinating article. You should look for it. But he says that the minute he felt that he cannot participate in this experiment anymore was the minute that he realized the implications the right to privacy has for other people. He forgot to log off from the program. He logged on uh, to a Zoom training uh, class. Okay, at the beginning of the, of the pandemic, we were all at home. And then there was a screenshot of the trainer in her uh, sport clothes, in her own private home. She's not related at all to the, to the employer, to the workplace, organizing at home, organizing her, her home for the class. So this basically means that uh, the employer has information about a third person who is not related at all to the workplace. Uh, so just to summarize it, we can see that those programs that are very uh, common today in the U.S., violate the right to privacy. I think it's very obvious to all of us, but it also violates the right to privacy of third parties, such as family members, people who are interacting with me online or offline in the background. But, and this is a huge thing, I think, they also involve third parties as violators. Those tech companies, they uh, intentionally create escalation in what those programs do in order to, um, to compete with other uh, companies and to uh, make greater uh, sales. And they violate the right to privacy while they, uh, they create a program. And this will take me to the question of regulation. And I will refer to it very briefly because I have only four minutes, I think. Uh, so in order to deal with this uh, problem, I uh, propose uh, uh, to embrace three uh, principles in the US context, the proportionality principle, which is very common in Israel and some of the European countries as well using workers' representative and privacy by design approach, which is also very familiar in the EU and Canada. So the proportionality principles, I assume that you're all too aware to that, says that we need to take into account both the right to privacy of the employee and the economic interest of the employer. In the current situation, all those monitoring programs, uh, when they are used in the private sphere of the employee at a private home, tilts the scale in the direction of the professional interest of the employer, the expense of the right to privacy of the employee. I offer to rebalance this, um, this equation by using the three uh, subtests. Um, and all of them, you can see, all of them are not really followed in our case. Uh, it's quite clear that most of those programs are used in order to scare employees, to make them work all day long without having any tiny small breaks because maybe there will be screenshot at that uh, specific moment. This is the first test. The second test, there are other, other people all around the world work from home and they do it very, very productively. There are other means to ensure that uh, workers are actually working and there is no proportionate balance. In order to ensure that there is an actual proportionate balance that both the employer and the employees and their rights are at stake, are taken into consideration, um, 
we should require employers to generate a privacy policy for teleworkers in the specific workplace with the involvement and agreement of workers' representative. Uh, if the employer does not agree to do some, this sort of uh, privacy policy, he will not be able, this is a strict law, he will not be able to uh, ask his employees to uh, install those, um, those monitoring programs. This was made in order to um, force the employer to negotiate with the uh, employee's representative. It's a huge problem in the US. Uh, this, of course, will enable us transparency and notice. The employees will, be know, will know what is being watched. Consent, even though it's only a collective consent because uh, the workers' representative are the one who consent in my name, it's better from the current situation. And adjustment, the privacy policy will be adjusted to the specific workplace with the specific needs, the specific roles. And uh, not everyone has to be watched during the day at all. And even if they are watched, there are other means to, to make sure that they're actually working. And finally, it, uh, of course, uh, um, um, based in a sense on formal suggestion to involve trade unions in the uh, digital age, negotiating the algorithm in Valerio de Stefano Awards, and also the French original um, um, right to disconnect was based on the idea that trade unions will be uh, negotiating with the employer on the right to disconnect and everything will be published eventually in the, in the charter. So this idea of negotiating what is going on at home what, uh, while uh, employees are working from home is already familiar in today's world. And lastly, and I think most importantly, and I will talk it very, very briefly, is the privacy by design approach. The privacy by design approach was initiated in the 90s in Canada. It was embraced by many European countries. It is part of the GDPR today. And basically the privacy by design approach, what it says is when a company creates a program, when a company generates a program, it has to take the right to privacy into account. It cannot create a program that violates the right to privacy from the very initial stage of imagining, imagining the product and afterwards creating it, selling it, and using it in the, in the, in the user's room, in the user's uh, homes. In our case, I uh, offer to embrace the privacy by design, both in the US context, thanks to the GDPR, et cetera, and they have all kinds of negotiation uh, about it as well, but mainly in the workplace context. This basically means that employees will have a legal right against those tech companies if they create programs that violate the right to privacy. Um, as you can see, it was quite clear those companies didn't think about the right to privacy at all, and they can imagine, they can create other programs that make sure that the employee is actually working without violating so severely the right to privacy. So this is it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. I also thank you for keeping in time. Uh, we have now uh, the second presentation. It's a joint presentation uh, by Elena uh, Gramano from uh, Milano, from Bocconi, and uh, David uh, Mangan or Mangan. Um, from um, City University in London. Uh, it's a joint presentation and they will share the presentation. Um, it's on uh, remote work. Okay, Elena, no, you are starting, yeah? No, David. Oh, David is starting, okay. okay thank you for, uh, to the organizers. And uh, thank you for attending, as uh, Tammy said, early in the morning. Uh, we, uh, for time considerations, we're going to abbreviate this uh, presentation. Uh, I think from a, an employer's point of view, this is what employers think you're doing when you're remote working. Uh, this is a square in London. Uh, and so what are we looking at with remote work? What we're looking at, and just getting right to the point, we're a bit more critical of the future of remote work. We don't think that this is going to be something as widespread. There you go. So we were just spanning the world there for a minute. Uh, so. We're a bit more critical of this. We don't think that remote work is something that will be as widely up, uh, taken up as the momentum suggests right now. Uh, so with that in mind, what we're suggesting is right now is sort of a test period. And so the last bullet point there, the, we're into a period where we have hybrid remote working. 
And the question is, well, what will this period yield? Will it be a test period that employers say, well, this doesn't work? Or will it show that uh, remote work can work effectively? Now, we had the United Kingdom, but because they left the EU, we're just going to skip them uh, and go right to Ireland. Ireland has a legislation that it, it has drafted, and it does not have a right to request remote work at present. And I'll just draw your attention, sorry, it's a bit uh, covered up, but the last bullet point there, in Ireland, there's a bit of optimism, and I'll just read it for you because it's a bit blocked. As time goes on, it is likely that telework and fl a flexible approach to work organization will become a more prominent feature for employers and employees. Uh, I appreciate the optimism. Uh, I don't share it, though, and I'll explain why in the Irish context. The draft bill that they have, uh, it asks employers to devise a remote work policy. So what this does is employers can define the parameters of any uh, request for remote working, but, uh, and it's limited to employees alone. So right there we have a limitation as to how widespread re uh, requests can be in Ireland. But here, and it's a bit of a, a big slide, but that's done on purpose to show this is what employees have to do. They have to provide all these details. So more or less, employees are being asked to make the uh, argument for why they should be able to work remotely. And I'll draw your attention to E in the second bullet point. They also provide a self-assessment. So in other words, if you're going to fail, <laughs> you're going to have your own words used against you when you put in a request. Now, one thing and a criticism I have of the legislation is it is actually, I think it was written in a rush because there are a lot of gaps in it. So for example, it doesn't speak to duration. So if you're an employee and you say, we are going to, I'd like to request remote working, ideally that would likely be a trial period of, let's say half a year or something. It doesn't speak to duration in the legislation. Now, this issue of duration comes up again because, well, what's the timeline for an employer to process this? Uh, an employer has to give a decision in 12 weeks, but when does that start? It seems as though it's on the employee to give this uh, request in advance in enough time for there to be the 12 weeks period plus maybe some more. So here, what we're pointing out is that th there is a very loose framework, and what I suggest is the Irish legislation actually gives the facsimile of a re right to request, but it doesn't really give much substantively. And to reinforce that point, I draw your attention to there are 13 reasons, 13 business grounds in the draft legislation as to why an employer can reject a request. So a lot of time was spent on uh, a right, to, uh, sorry, the reasons to reject a request. And I'll draw your attention to two. The second bullet point, health and safety grounds. There are a lot of questions here. Does this mean that an employer is going to inspect the, the workplace, theoretically, which would be the home? Does this mean that uh, they provide some sort of uh, independent assessment? And this becomes a bit of an issue when during lockdown, we were all working in that very same space. So what I suggest is from an industrial relations perspective, it actually creates more potential for conflict amongst the parties. Secondly, internet connectivity. In Ireland, it's remarkable how about a quarter of the population has uh, unreliable internet access. So if you are requesting remote work, and you're in an area that is not well serviced by the internet, by broadband, then that is a reason for your employer to, re to reject your request. So here we have an issue of geographical location, if uh, amongst other points. Finally, appeals. Appeals is sort of a cute term 
statistics in the legislation uh, because I call it cute because if you look at the second bullet point, there's actually no right to appeal. An employee cannot appeal the decision. They can only appeal based on a failure to follow a procedural aspect, such as not giving a decision. So uh, he, the legislation, as I say, provides the idea that there is this right to request, but it doesn't go much further. And we'll move to where we are now. Thank you very much, David. Uh, I follow up uh, um, presenting very briefly the current legal framework in the Italian legal system before uh, giving back the floor to, to David for the final conclusions. Uh, in Italy, um, in 2017, a law was introduced in order to regulate what we call smart working, which is a way of performing the working activity within a subordinate employment relationship um, that uh, uh, is peculiar because the working activity is conducted partially outside the employer's premises, outside the uh, workplace and partially inside the workplace. Um, it was a law that was introduced before the pandemic, but that uh, was relied upon heavily, let's say, during the pandemic, even though um, many scholars pointed out that the way uh, in which the work was conducted at, from home during the pandemic has nothing to do with a smart work, a way of working. Uh, basically, the law provides for uh, the parties of the employment relationship, therefore at the individual level, to um, determine mutually the conditions of their uh, smart working uh, way of uh, exchanging the working performance and the um, remuneration. Uh, through an agreement that is a side agreement in respect to the employment contract that is still, of course, valid there. There is no dispute on the classification of the employment relationship if the um, working activity is conducted uh, remotely. Such an agreement shall provide for a number of, uh, shall regulate a number of aspects. It is interesting to note that uh, the lawmaker um, believed that the parties at the individual level were able to regulate, um, let's say, a uh, peculiar aspect of the employment contract. For example, the way according to which the employer shall exercise uh, um, his or her prerogatives. For example, uh, the power to direct the working activity, to monitor the working activity, coming back to what our colleague just said. Uh, and also to sanction the uh, worker in case of uh, misbehavior, misconduct. Um, the uh, parties shall also uh, mutually regulate uh, uh, the right to disconnect, um, the pauses, rest times, because one of the other um, specific aspects of the uh, regulation of 2017 is that of uh, uh, not providing any limitation to uh, the working time regulation as long as the maximum hours of work uh, according to the law and according to collective bargaining agreements are respected. Therefore, great flexibilities for the parties to both regulate the work, uh, sorry, the place of work and the time of work. And what it is interesting though is that uh, um, the lawmaker pointed out, and I would like to stress this aspect, pointed out that at least part of the working activity shall still be carried out inside uh, the workplace. We can assume that there are a number of reasons behind these uh, decisions. For example, um, do not uh, put the uh, employee in the position of being uh, um, separated from his uh, colleagues, uh, uh, put the employee in a position of being able to dialogue with the people in the workplace and with the employer, therefore not to be completely excluded from the working environment, but at the same time leaving the parties uh, a great flexibility in determining how, where and when to perform uh, the, the working activity. As I said, during the pandemic, the law provides uh, that there was no need for an agreement to be signed between the parties in order to 
um, switch to a remote way of conducting the activity. Therefore, the employer could unilaterally impose uh, uh, the employee to work from a remote uh, station, meaning from home at the time. And that is why many scholars pointed out that uh, this is a separate regulation that we might still call remote working or smart working, but has nothing to do with it. With it was just a way to force citizens to stay at home. Um, during the uh, pandemic. There are a number of uh, problematic issues related to the um, smart working regulation, starting from the fact that the law does not mention at all the role of collective bargaining agreements, even though nothing prohibit the, prohibits them from being involved, but still there is no explicit reference to their role in such regulation. But at least it was a, a sort of for, um, forward way of think at the way of performing the working activity uh, finally in 2017. Now, please, David, if you want to continue. So looking at the questions uh, within the, each country, that there are some questions as to the viability, overall what we suggest is that there are uh, a couple of uh, several obstacles in the place of uh, a more widespread remote working po uh, policy or uh, more people being in remote work. One, as I mentioned with Ireland, was is infrastructure. So if there's no infrastructure for uh, everyone in the country to have access to broadband, then this is obviously a very simple uh, obstacle. Uh, and it feeds into other public policy goals that, frankly, in Ireland, I'm a bit surprised the government hasn't really tried more to tackle. Second is control. Uh, Tammy had mentioned a bit of the gig economy. I think one lesson we take from the cases, wherever they were, is that the platform companies have tried to exert remarkable control over platform workers while also saying that they're not employees. And I take that point more broadly with remote work, and that is, more generally, uh, we have evidence that employers are concerned about monitoring what workers do, what people are doing, especially when they're remote working. So if you're in a workplace and you're, if you're in an office, it's easier to monitor. So that's another obstacle. A third point is, I think we can exaggerate a bit what happened in COVID-19. I think we have to remember that we were all locked down. There was nothing going on outdoors. Uh, now we're at a conference uh, now. So things are a lot more open. And with remote working, there are more opportunities, uh, if we think sort of cynically like an employer, for workers not to be working, maybe to be in a coffee shop with friends or something. So not the best picture of uh, workers, but nonetheless one that seems to be prevalent. And finally, a lack of will, and this may be the largest. There's data in the UK, for example, before the uh, pandemic, well before the pandemic, that there was uh, not a lot of uh, favor in remote work. If we look more recently in Ireland, the third bullet point, 68% reported operational barriers, a lack of support, lack of buy-in from line managers. And the last bullet point, I think more long term, we have to keep in mind, is there going to be a difference in terms of career prospects? Do those who work in the office have a better opportunity for advancement than those who are remote working, uh, whatever the reason may be for remote working? So those are, uh, that's a summary of our sort of skepticism about whether or not remote working will become as prevalent as the momentum right now suggests. Thank you. Thank you, Elena and David, for this critical account of uh, remote working. Um, and uh, now we have quite appropriate for our topic of remote work a remote uh, presentation. Um, we have now um, Efrosine Bakritsi from, yes. uh, from uh, Greece, uh, but currently working in uh, Germany. She joins us from Frankfurt, as she told me. Are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can <coughs> hear you. And now we can also see a PowerPoint. Uh, uh, Efrosine uh, is talking about uh, her comparative study, uh, appropriately comparing Greece and Germany. 
um, and uh, it's on um, regulation of uh, remote work in these two countries. Everything is your floor. Yes, please interrupt me in case you do not hear me. <laughs> Technology problems. We can, we, can okay. hear, we can see the PowerPoint, yes. Perfect, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity today to present. Uh, I'm really honored to deliver a presentation and uh, thank you again for attending this morning. Uh, my research focuses on the measures that uh, have been sensibly used in many countries as a means to contain the spread of the virus. We all experienced extraordinary uh, and urgent measures, such as restrictions to physical movement within and across and reductions of social contacts, all of which had implications for work activities. Telework, remote work, or mobile work were used extensively for these purposes. Uh, and these are made possible due to the digitalization of work and the possibility to use new technologies, creating virtual workplace workspaces. Um, today, I will talk about remote work and telework in Greece and Germany and compare the two regimes. Uh, the pandemic is not over yet. Uh, the continuous use of telework remains necessary for several reasons. To um, <clears throat> contribute to less infections and um, <clears throat> advertising the health and safety of employees. My main argument speaks for uh, a hybrid work model in the post-pandemic work architecture. Um, we see a trend towards a hybrid model. But of course, the weaknesses of enforcement of rights, of rights may hinder the development of such a model. And the comparison between Greece and Germany may serve as an indicative example and provide some useful insights for the future. Uh, disclaimer for my work, um, I'm presenting prelim some pre preliminary considerations based on my research. I'm happy to discuss and exchange with you on this topic further. <clears throat> um, my presentation consists of four parts. Uh, in the first, I provide some data on the use of telework before and then in the... Uh, after that, I continue with two case studies, Greece and Germany, mapping their legal frameworks of telework and in these frameworks during the pandemic. And in the final part of my presentation, I bring some pre preliminary considerations based on the comparison. Before I embark on the analysis of the uh, regimes, uh, I, I would like to provide some useful information. In the period before the pandemic, remote work or telework was not the rule in the two countries under our investigation. In 2019, the employed persons working from home as a percentage of the total employment was 1.9% in Greece. 5,2% in Germany and 5,4% in the EU. In 2021, the respective percentage has risen in Greece to 6,7%, more than tripled in comparison to the period before the pandemic. Uh, in Germany to 17%, similarly more than tripled, and in the EU 27 to 13,4%. These increases indicate a turn in the culture of presence at work. The data retrieved from Eurostat and the European Union Labour Force uh, Survey. In this um, employed persons, self-employed are not counted. The percentage of self-employed is much higher and the change during the pandemic was not that high. I could not find official data for the public sector teleworking, uh, so I am not providing you any here. And I continue with the case study of Greece. Greece is still in the process of recovery from the economic crisis. Its legacies still dominate the legal, political and academic discussions, leaving limited space to issues stemming from the digitalization of work and the use of new technologies. Actually, the COVID pandemic found Greece totally unprepared to such a transition to telework or remote work. And why is this? Because the country had to face more demanding issues due to the legacies of the economic crisis. The corona health crisis intensified the inefficiencies and inadequacies of the Greek labor relations system with regard to digitalization. The crisis management strategies and framework in place were not fully developed, and the approach for dealing with the upper unprecedented health crisis was rather conservative, taking measures step by step depending on the evolution of the pandemic. 
extraordinary legislative procedures without prior consultation with the Parliament were used extens extensively for this purpose. One of these measures was the mandatory use of remote or distance work in the private and public sector. The Legislative Act adopting this measure used the broader term of remote or distance work and not only telework. The employer was allowed to introduce unilaterally remote work. The aim of the Act was to give companies or enterprises the possibility for flexibility. Initially, this measure was introduced for a specific period, but it was prolonged for several times. It was also combined with other measures. For the unilateral introduction of remote or distance work by managerial prerogative, there was no prior agreement between the employer and the employee necessary. In the, in the aftermath of the pandemic, the requirement of prior agreement for remote work uh, is restored. During the several waves of pandemic, these measures were extended or repeated to various degrees, depending on the development of the pandemic and the eventual pressure on the fragile Greek public health system. Uh, and the compulsory remote work framework became even stricter by introducing administrative reporting requirements regarding uh, uh, security staff. Few of the provisions in these legislative acts regulated minimally the performance of remote work or telework. Under these circumstances, neither the Greek state nor the companies were prepared for such a transition to telework on such a large scale. Uh, what is new? Greece was unprepared for such a transition. The regulatory framework that existed was outdated and inappropriate for meeting the, need, the needs of the new reality. After many months uh, implementing the legal framework date from 2010, an attempt to fill the regulatory gap took place with the modernization of the labor law in 2021. The new provision included the definition of telework. This definition includes home-based uh, home telework or mobile work, and also alternating telework can be included from its wording. Um, it uh, only uh, concerns dependent work, multiple forms of work, such as full-time, part-time, or other forms of employment relationships. The dependent character of employment is based on the traditional criteria of subordination. However, due to the increased autonomy of teleworkers regarding working place and time, the qualification of the relationship as an employment one may not always be easy. In addition, the character of telework in Greece remains voluntary. Uh, and uh, both for the employer and the employee under regular circumstances and is introduced by consensus. The agreement between the employer and the employee on telework is an integral part of the employment relationship. Uh, in, situa in situations of public health protection, telework may be introduced unilaterally by the employer's decision or upon the employee's application. Within the framework of general obligation of the employer to inform the employee on the substantial working conditions, the employer has additional obligation to inform the employee by any appropriate means on the special conditions of telework within an eight-day deadline. The principle of equal treatment between teleworkers and workers performing work at the premises of the employer is provided for explicitly in the law, with the reservation that some derogations may be permitted if differentiations are due to the nature of telework. And we have also other important provisions, as an explicit right to disconnect, the right to privacy and protection of personal data, health and safety and occupational accidents and provision of equipment, maintenance thereof and coverage of teleworking costs. An additional law for the working arrangements in the public sector also provided for the performance of work from a distance under normal and extraordinary circumstances in the public sector. And this law sets out a very detailed and extended regulatory framework for telework in the public sector. <clears throat> In Germany, from a first glance, German labor relations system seems to be well prepared for the transition to come due to digitalization. The discussions on digital transformations and the future of work are ongoing since a long time now compared to the respective discussions in Greece. The ground for initiatives is therefore mature, but Germany faces difficulties in reaching consensus regarding concrete legislative acts on mobile or remote work. Such legislative initiatives would address the fragmentation of legal framework on telework or remote work. Is Germany a step behind Greece in this regard? Interestingly, in Germany, a legal definition of telework exists since 2016. 
in the ordinance on workspaces alone, the legislator lays down a rather narrow definition of telework. This definition may not cover cases where the employee uses his or her laptop, personal computer, or desk for the performance of work. For these cases, the above provisions that, not, that do not apply. Uh, many existing home office workplaces are still not subject to the workplace ordinance. And in practice, this form of telework has been termed as home office in Germany. The implementation of telework is not regulated in detail, but usually an agreement between the employer and the employee makes the arrangement of telework or mobile work concrete, including matters of establishing the workplace, work time, data protection and secrecy, right to access and control and termination of home office arrangements. Under normal single uh, conditions, changing the place of work by introducing telework or mobile work modifies the basis of the employment relationship especially when the employee performs work with his, own, uh, his or her own work equipment. There is also entitlement home office for some employees uh, based on the legal institution of the company practices. In addition, according to the principle of equal treatment under labor law, if the employer offers even only a small number of employees the possibility of mobile work, it is likely that the employees will also have a right to home office. Moreover, the Federal Act on Gender Equality lays down the possibility to offer telework and mobile work to employees who have family or care obligations and therefore can result in a claim to an error-free discretionary decision regarding the introduction of telework. Finally, for persons with severe disabilities, the right to home office can result from the provisions of the ninth book of the Social Code according to which the employer is obliged to provide employment that is suitable for disability. The main identified patterns of telework in Germany are alternating telework, mobile work, and home office. However, their boundaries are not legally regulated and the rules applying to each pattern are not clear. Um, a right to home office, an illustrative example for the difficulties in implementing legislative changes, is the discussion on the right to work from home or home office, an entitlement that could be enforceable. No regulation is adopted at this time uh, of the presentation. In October 2020, there was a draft legislation where the right to 24 days home office activity per year was to be introduced. Due to the strong critique by social partners and employers, a new referee draft on a mobile work act in November 2020 was presented. In this draft, mobile work would be regulated on an individual negotiation basis between employers and employees. In the recent government coalition contract of 2021, there is no provision on a right to home office. What did the corona pandemic brought, bring? The change that the pandemic brought in this regard was the temporary obligation to home office. In the beginning of the pandemic, there were only suggestions and appeals to employers and employees to make use of telework, where and if possible, to limit contacts and hinder the spreading of the virus. This was the so-called light right to home off. However, there was a health and safety public law provision in the Infectious Disease Protection Act applying to all employees in the private and public sector, including employee-like persons, for a temporary obligation to use home office. Since November 2020, employers in Germany have been obliged to offer employees the opportunity to work from home, unless there were operational reasons for not doing so. This was a public law provision, and an amendment of the employment contract was not necessary. As a self-executive provision from a civil law perspective, it excluded the application of contrary individual and collective labor law provisions. This norm excluded mobile work, as its wording refers to in the employee's home and not another place. The temporary obligation to home office ended on 19th March 2020. Moreover, according to previous case law, the statutory occupational accidents insurance did not cover cases when accidents happened at home while teleworking because these cases were characterized as own economic activity. The seventh book of the Social Code regarding the statutory accident insurance has been amended in May 2021 in order to cover all work-related activities during mobile work in this insurance and cover gaps of protection that emerged from the extended use of home office during the pandemic. Finally, the Act on the Modernization of Works Councils added an additional co-determination right for the arrangement of mobile work performed by means of information and communication technologies. The Works Constitution Act has been amended the right of co-determination 
in the design of mobile work was introduced. This, uh, the aim of this provision was the promotion of mobile work and ensuring uniform and binding frame, framework conditions for employees. A right to home office can be stipulated in works agreement where numerous issues uh, can be dealt with and regulated coherently. The first change to the pandemic is no longer in force, as already explained, but the last two changes are here to stay and reinforce certain aspects of telework and mobile work in the German legal order. Some of my preliminary considerations uh, in this topic um, regard that the case studies show two completely different approaches to regulating telework and remote work. In Greece, the legislator regulated in a binding law many aspects of telework or mobile work. Although this is a quite detailed regulation, a number of issues remain open and they need to be further specified by delegated or administrative acts and interpreted by the competent courts. Moreover, the implementation in practice is still to be seen. These extensive regulations can partially address the current challenges. There are no provisions or training of teleworkers who have to acquire specialized digital skills to fulfill their work obligations. The Greek labor market comprises predominantly of small and medium-sized companies, which cannot introduce and maintain a teleworking regime compared to large enterprises. And the Greek legislator would need to take this into consideration and facilitate the transition to telework regime. It is also worth noting that the Greek legislator adopted a separate law on the teleworking regime in the public administration. <coughs> Sorry. Germany, on the other hand, has not adopted specific regulations on telework or mobile work, although the need for a clear regulatory framework is evident. The fragmentation of rules and applicability of the diverse provisions for some groups of employees may contribute to confusion regarding entitlements and hinder a coherent approach for all employees. The dualistic German workers' representation system at the trade union and works council level plays an important role for facing the challenges of virtual workplace and digitalization of work. The state and structure of telework and mobile work is argued to be essentially a task of the regulation of where works agreement between the employer and the works council due to the proximity to the needs of the individual companies. In practice, the strong role that the works council play in Germany and the regulation of mobile work or telework at company level seem to have filled the regulatory gap so far. The corona pandemic had similar effects on the teleworking mobile working regimes in both countries. A temporary obligation to telework, home office was established as an extraordinary measure to contain the spread of the virus and protect the health of employees and their families. However, the long-term effect is different in the two countries. Greece went a step further to modernize the teleworking legal framework, while Germany opted for stagnation without moving forward. The developments show that we are drifting away from the traditional concepts of labor law with the solution of traditional spatial, temporal, and organizational bound boundaries of work. The golden ratio may be found somewhere in the middle. State intervention to protect the rights of employees is not a panacea, as the parties involved may find ways to circumvent stringent regulations. On the other hand, it should not be left exclusively upon the one or the other party to determine the working conditions and rights and obligations. A human-centered, as opposed to a resources-centered approach, and the balancing of interests in the context of digital sustainable work with the active involvement of social partners may be a challenge, and the experiences of these two countries as complementary to one another serve as the basis for further discussions and considerations. In my opinion, the focus must be placed on the people who are the main and most decisive drivers of change in the digitalized labor market. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Afrosini, for this um, account of uh, the impact of the COVID situation on uh, current regulations, making them more flexible. Uh, adjusting them to the situation, but also giving us some ideas on long-term effects of these impacts on regulation for change of regulation and what will uh, be in the future. But before we, uh, before I open the, uh, the floor to discuss these uh, impacts on labor law and the uh, very basics of uh, labor law in terms of um, definition of employee and um, the um, integration 
and control um, of the employer over the employee. Let's give our um, discussant a chance uh, to comment on the three um, uh, presentations. Um, the uh, discussant is also uh, joining us remotely. Uh, it's uh, Marco Biasi from Milan. Um, Marco, can you hear us and uh, is everything okay? Yes, Ralph. Okay, yeah, yeah. so I give you the floor now uh, for your comments. Thank you very much, Ralph. Actually, I'm I am from Milan. I do work from the, for the University of Milan, but now I'm connected from Stanford University. So okay. the heart of the Silicon Valley, it's 1 a.m. So I'm perfectly fit for the focus of today, at least I hope. So thanks for uh, the organizer. You see the, the darkness uh, in my back. Yeah, but we can't see so your it's 1 a.m. Yeah. Do you have a PowerPoint, you said? Yes, yes, I okay, do. I so will, we I will share that. it immediately. Yeah, sure. I will abide by the rules uh, in respect in the 10, lim 10 minute uh, limit. Here we go. Please confirm me that you can see my slide, please. Not yet. Now you do? Not yet. Well, let's see. In the meanwhile, I keep, uh, I keep talking and I thank, uh, at least I thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to serve uh, as a discussant in this very interesting and intriguing session. So let me also compliment the, the, the presenters on their uh, very amazing job in their presentation. I found their presentation extremely uh, engaging and interesting and the fact that they are addressing uh, uh, the same topic, which is the topic, as we know, of telework, but from uh, uh, different and I would say complemented, uh, complementary uh, angles. So this made uh, the overall discussion uh, even more interesting uh, and uh, enriching uh, for us. Now you see my slides, do you? Unfortunately, still not. No. No, you don't see. Okay. Well, that doesn't matter. I can I can uh, use my my slides uh, maybe in my mm, personal computer, and we hopefully you can. Uh, follow my, my, just my discussion uh, orally. So I will just address uh, each of the three presentations uh, individually, and then at the very end, uh, in, my last, uh, in the last part of my discussion, uh, I will uh, try Just to uh, come up with uh, some uh, general comments, that would say cross comments, on the overall uh, discussion of today. Let me just start, of course, uh, with uh, Tammy. I say, of course, because Tammy dealt with the US, the country I mean, and one of the countries that have been uh, studying uh, the most in terms of labor law regulation. So uh, Tammy uh, addressed the issue basically of the intrusive methods of supervising the employee while the employee is performing the activity through the so-called home office, which she says is an intermediate category between office and home. Uh, and she also um, holds and thinks that uh, um, remote working has become now an integral part of the future work. So this uh, uh, praxis, uh, these conducts of employers, especially in the US, uh, have, uh, might be a staple in the future unless a regulation is uh, uh, enacted in order to, I would say, curb or at least to limit uh, this intrusive uh, supervising system on the employees uh, through software, GPS, stream record, worker pictures that she, that Tammy brilliantly described uh, before and also in a very interesting uh, uh, paper. She also points out how, the, how uh, in the US the uh, privacy law and privacy regulation does not apply fully in the private sector uh, employment, uh, unlike uh, the public sector regulation. And this is definitely, and, uh, definitely true. Uh, you can also mention, it is just a suggestion for Tammy maybe to to add a reference uh, to the practice of so-called shoulder surfing, surfing, which is an activity of the employers who uh, compel the employees to share their uh, social media passwords in order for the employers to even more intrusively uh, monitor uh, what the employees are doing and always monitor what the employees are doing on and off duty, we might say. So it's very intrusive the way that employers behave and can are allowed to behave by the uh, U.S. current and excellent U.S. regulation. So I, I definitely uh, appreciate. Marco, Marco, we can see your uh, PowerPoint now. Uh, maybe you. Oh, want to... very good. Fine, you you can ask for the control can... if you want. 
Okay, good. Maybe you can so, go on. You can see the first page, so maybe there's more to see. Okay, I'm. I'm. Uh, all right. Let me just check. Now I'm. I'm in the third page. So actually, uh, uh, you should be seeing uh, and watching my third page. But in in any case, I'm sorry for this inconvenience. I will it's go okay, on no, with my with no. my speech. In any case. Now we can see the third page. Yeah. Okay. Good. Very good. <laughs> Uh, you know that's nine hour time difference. Maybe the slides are affected by this difference too. I mean, it makes sense. Uh, so this said, um, uh, we, I was talking about the proposal that um, Tammy advances in order to, I would say, mitigate the impact of the practice of monitoring by the U.S. lawyers, uh, U.S. employers. Uh, first of all, I definitely found extremely persuasive the agreement, the, the proposal to. Um, somehow enhance the principle of proportionality in the supervision of employees through the balance of the employer's property right, I would say employer's liberty in my favorite terminology, with the employee's right to privacy, in other terms, employee's freedom in my uh, terminology. This somehow mirrors uh, the solution adopted by the EU model or the GDPR system based on the proportionality of the monitoring uh, of data by the employers. Also, I fully agree with the idea to propose uh, a better, more advanced uh, negotiation process uh, on the uh, monitoring of employees, especially in the case of remote working, uh, through the uh, involvement of the union as a way also to mitigate the unilateral power that the U.S. employers actually nowadays withhold. So let's just skip to the next uh, presentation by uh, the friends and colleagues uh, Elena and David. Uh, actually, they, they point out, I mean, they analyze the different uh, legal regulation, uh, uh, British, Irish, and Italian regulation of remote working. Actually, they point out how uh, you can still find the enduring signs of subordination also in remote working. Uh, you see that remote working, uh, the example where that Elena uh, used and relied upon, which is the example of Italian agile work, is still a, a, a clear example uh, and undoubtedly example of uh, subordinate employment. Uh, uh, of course, the way that the employer prerogative are exercised are slightly different, but this does not mean that the intensity of the employer's power is not felt also when the employee is working outside of the employer's premises. So they correctly, in my point of view, point out how there's still a need to reassess the axis of protection from the, uh, I would say, vintage employment subordination in the premises, but still there is a clear need of protection for the employees also outside of the employer premises, normally at home, but not only. Uh, they uh, face and they take uh, weight in on the difference between the right to request flexible, uh, flexible working, so remote working, versus the right to obtain, to, I would say, impose on the employer flexible uh, working, which is definitely more advanced, but maybe also uh, more critical and more uh, something that has to be handled with much more care. And basically, at the very end, they point out that uh, I, I, try, I find it extremely persuasive how there is a clear link between the proliferation of remote working, maybe in the future, but also in the present, and the, uh, I would say, capacity, ability of the employees to show that they can be uh, productive even if they are not working under the strict physical presence control uh, uh, of the employer in the workplace, but also uh, in another way of performing the working activity, which has to be more target-oriented hmm? uh, in terms of obligation of result, we may say in civil law terminologies, rather than obligation of means, this would be uh, maybe if they are able, they can show uh, the employers that they are able to achieve their goals also without the strict supervision, that's an incentive for the employers to allow them to work remotely and maybe also to less uh, per, uh, intrusively control their activity while they are not uh, working uh, in the premises, but they're working uh, at home or some, from somewhere else from the employer's premises. Last but definitely not least, uh, Efrosny Bakirsky, sorry for the pronunciation, my bad Italian accent does not help me, 
um, she uh, compares to very different uh, legal regulation, I would say regulation on non legal in strict term, terms uh, of uh, uh, remote working, the Greek and the German one. She points out uh, how oh, both of the two solutions uh, show some flaws or some, uh, some issues that might be addressed, uh, I would say, uh, separately. And this is why uh, I follow her uh, scheme and her pattern of presentation, focusing first on the Greek case, uh, how uh, she um, observes and she points out how the Greek case uh, was featured by, uh, I would say, a late um, regulation on uh, um, remote working, so which was uh, enacted after or during the pandemic. So when the pandemic erupted, the Greek, she says, was not fully compliant, was not fully ready to such a mass shift towards uh, teleworking. So, but then she also uh, highlights how the uh, Greek legislation uh, uh, subsequently somehow adapted and passed a regulation which uh, still, she still uh, observes uh, might present uh, some, uh, something else to work on uh, or to uh, possibly amend. Uh, I would say on the opposite side, the flip side of the coin, we might place the German example because the German example was, was and is still featured by the uh, most uh, vast use of the or reliance on the uh, industry relations system, so more uh, collective bargaining than law uh, in the regulation of telework. Um, collective bargaining, but also individual bargaining, because as she explains very clearly, uh, still uh, the um, employee does not have the right in Germany to have access to telework. It's still a matter of consensus, so consensual nature of the agreement on teleworking. Plus, there is an extensive, a very uh, important uh, uh, present and role of the World Council, Beatrix Rath, as in the uh, tradition of German uh, industrial relations. This is the same for the right to disconnect, uh, which is uh, uh, regulated by law under the recent uh, Greek uh, legislation. The same is for Italy and many other countries, France uh, as the uh, precursors, um, France and Spain too. Uh, in Germany is all still left to the uh, collective uh, autonomy, we say collective agreement or the TRIPS agreement. Um, she, um, I'm also referring, always referring to a Prosny, uh, she somehow uh, clear, uh, clarifies how we have uh, two models, a statutory approach versus a collective approach. She uh, observes and concludes that maybe the best idea, the third way, is somewhere in the middle between a statutory and a collective approach. I definitely agree with her uh, point in this matter, but still uh, as a personal suggestion, maybe to expand, to uh, uh, more uh, thoroughly explore this matter, maybe uh, also to uh, further clarify what she means uh, under, from a legal point of view, under the uh, idea or under the auspice uh, to um, pursue a human-centered approach in the regulation of telework, because uh, we might also agree that a human-centered approach would be the right one, but then we should maybe find some solution, some institution uh, to approach uh, through this uh, human-centered uh, methodology, human-centered approach. So maybe this is uh, just a hint or a possible way to expand uh, uh, the discussion uh, on this matter. Concluding remarks, because time uh, goes, uh, goes by very, uh, very quickly. Uh, major issues of telework, and this is some, I would say, some uh, cross uh, um, comments regarding the all three presentations. They all uh, uh, very clearly um, observed and remark how telework presents and uh, shows uh, uh, common uh, issues almost in any country, uh, invasive monitoring, especially in the US, but not only temporosity, so the always on culture, so the lack of free time, the dilution of the working time versus the boundary between working time and the time off, uh, liberty time, we might say. So this, this uh, um, blurring distinction between time, working time, and no working time is still a matter of discussion. Employees' responsibility and employers' power, of course, and also as Elena and David very uh, clearly 
uh, display in their, uh, in their research uh, is a very important matter to discuss uh, for the further regulation of uh, remote working. Of course, uh, the three uh, presentations show different uh, legal frameworks. They uh, dealt with the very different legal frameworks. The US example, low, uh, low protection, but high technology, uh, different sources. Uh, for example, law in Germany, predominantly law versus collective bargaining, no, sorry, increase versus collective bargaining in uh, Germany. Still, I think that the, if I want to trace a final thread in the three presentation is their, uh, I would say, moderate uh, and not skeptical approach towards the institution of uh, telework. And I fully agree with all the three, uh, four presenters. Uh, on this point, uh, telework is considered both an opportunity also the, uh, and a challenge. So there is a, a positive side, I will say less positive side, I will say a challenging side of telework. Uh, I, my personal feeling is that the balanced approach is the uh, most uh, suitable approach. And just uh, to clarify uh, my, my point, my final point on this uh, specific matter, we can address uh, the issue of the access to telework in terms we might have two opposite way of approaching the team. So one way is to consider it an absolute right of the employee. On the other hand, you might consider it as an absolute uh, power uh, of the employer to impose upon uh, the employee, the, the remote working, like actually uh, occurred during uh, the uh, pandemic, I think. And I fully agree with uh, the presenters on the point, an intermediate uh, approach uh, is the uh, best one. So we might uh, think about framing uh, the access to teleworking as a matter of consensus and maybe as a matter of individual agreement under the umbrella of uh, collective agreement. I think that uh, the uh, uh, ultimately, uh, the major um, challenge of telework is not only a regulatory challenge, but it's a, a challenge for industry relations and the, uh, I wouldn't say participatory role, but still involvement role of the unions in the organization of labor. This is the challenge for the future and for the future of telework. Thank you very much for the attention. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Marco, for your for your comments. Before uh, I give the um, floor to our presenters to respond to your uh, to your comments, I would uh, like to invite the audience uh, to uh, um, for questions. And we have 15 minutes, uh, so there is some space to uh, ask questions to the um, um, to the presenters. Uh, who would like to start? Yes. Frank. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, all the interesting papers and Marco for the, the feedback you had on them. I have a lot of issues, so I just am going to pick out one thing that I am not just clear about yet, and that's the whole idea of trying to separate work from, let's say, non-work life in this whole debate. So we have the idea of work-life balance, we have the idea of separating, like we did in the past, the work time from the leisure time. We know that case law and regulators are struggling in approaching this through either saying we have your own, let's say, voluntary way of choosing your own time, or we leave the whole concept of working time, or we leave the whole thing of, let's say, uh, measuring working time. So I just want to figure out what do we do with working time, this whole discussion. We have a case in the European court, you know that, the CCOO on measuring working time. Do we measure working time of teleworkers or do we just leave this and let them alone and let them do and take it for granted that work and private life cannot be separated. We just have to deal with it. So that's my question. Okay, thank you. That rather a comment than a question, but uh, no, it's, a question. it's a question. Okay, good, good, good. Yeah, yeah it's a question. Uh, anybody else? There's, there's a. Can you also say your names, please? And uh, and uh, those up in the in the back there.
thank you very much, Silvia Rainone, for the European Trade Union Institute. Um, very thank you for the presentation. And I have a question, which is perhaps also a comment. Uh, because beside the like, um, more narrow perspective of well-being and separation between working time and telework and regulating in their employment relationship, there is also all the dimension of businesses with a more global scale that are basically shifting the business model to telework. They are allowing uh, workers to work from whatever. And these, um, I have the impression, may create um, downward pressure on working conditions, a sort of global social dumping on this, and may also um, redefine a bit the scope of the employment relation they're pushing toward autonomous work and self-employment uh, work. So I was wondering whether all these may fit within a national, what the national legislator or European legislator may do in this context. Thank you. There's another question over there. Um, uh, good morning, I'm Stefano Guadagni, University of Milan. Uh, actually, there, there is a, an interesting link, but there is also a question to, bo to all three representatives. Uh, one item that you... you uh, us, yes, sorry. Um, one item that I think is very relevant is that you highlighted is that the difference between uh, um, the, the massive expansion in the use of these various systems of what, with uh, the already existing either regulation and practices in place uh, at the, in, in company and national and supranational level. So uh, do you think that um, the fact that these practices and regulation already existed for more structured ways of uh, uh, working in, in, a, in a remote setting are to be kept separate or rather need to be integrated going forward with a broader regulation of the possibilities for the workers to access hybrid forms of work. Thank you. Thank you. Janice. Uh, Janice Balache, uh, University of Pennsylvania. You know, no one said this directly, but it seems to me implied in several of the presentation of, about remote working um, is that the employer response much of the time in monitoring it is pushing work away from hourly paid or weekly paid work back to piecework. It's like going back a century in time and you're measuring exact piecework. And just like people were compelled to work more and more and faster and faster and somebody would set a high rate. And trade unions historically pushed against that and tried to set a standard. And so I wonder if we're going backwards mm -hmm. um, to that and a little bit about the trade union response uh, and, and saying we're, that the remote worker, we think of it as being, oh, they're at a computer and this is sort of high level, but it's almost like the factory worker of 1922 or something. Very good to think about, yes. Thank you. Uh, Megan Harzel, Tilburg University. I have a very short question also <laughs> with an eye to the time. Considering all the, the, the problems with the remote work, a uh, question to all three of you, uh, of all four presenters. Would you advocate a right to work from home? Right. I can't see any more questions. Uh, I think it is then the time to give our presenters the chance to <coughs> respond to these comments and questions. Um, shall we go in the in the order of the presentation? Tommy, you want to start? Come up here. So first of all, thank you so much for the great comments. Um, I refer to three specific uh, points. First of all, uh, it's also an uh, answer in a sense to some of the questions that was raised, but I want to, uh, uh, to solve the disagreement that we have right regarding the question whether telework will spread or not. I think it, the, t the answer is somewhere in between, right? Because um, I think society is becoming more hybrid. This conference is the great example for that. This conference is hybrid. And probably the, the future workplace will also be hybrid. It means that some of the workers, some of the times, or all the workers, some of the time will work in the workplace, and some of them will work from home. But I, I assume it will be more hybrid. And maybe it's different from one state to another. And 
eventually, it's, it refers also to what Marco said. I don't think the challenges will uh, uh, vanish telework, but it's something that we need to face with. And this take you, take, takes me to, to your questions. Um, in the EU, we see um, more discussion about the right to, uh, to telework from home. In Israel, it's also we start to have a discussion about this, uh, this issue. In the US, there is no discussion about it, unfortunately, but it's not surprising. Um, I think we should have a right to, to work from home. Uh, the UK actually had a right to flexible work arrangement well before the pandemic due uh, to parenting, question of parenting, motherhood, and etc. But along with the right to, to, to work from home, we need to think more accurately by using trade unions on the challenges that we have regarding equality. You, you mentioned uh, socioeconomic equality, things, a question of geographic uh, um, a connection to the internet. Gender inequality, it seems like uh, telework is like promoting gender equality, but it's not necessarily true. Um, question of working time, etc. So it has to go together. We cannot have a right to, uh, to telework without thinking about the, the next day, all the challenges that we're facing. And lastly, I want to combine the, the Frank question, and, and I'm sorry, I, I, I know Janice, yeah, I know you. And, and your question, um, so when I was dealing with working time, the question of working time and telework, it seems like there are two main models. The European model, which is very, very strict. It about, it's about the right to disconnect. We want to have a strict division between working time and leisure time, also when the worker is working in leisure time, also when the worker is working from home, because uh, it's important for her well-being, um, not only for productivity, but for the well-being. If I'm like working all day long and I don't have clear uh, breaks uh, in my working day, it's not good for the, for the employee. Uh, so this is the European traditional way of thinking. In Italy, it's also the right to disconnect. In Italy, it was mainly starting with uh, teleworkers. And then Emmanuel Dignino is, is writing about it. And in the US, we have, uh, as, as just as you said, the products. We're talking about the products and not working time. How many products, uh, how many uh, units of work you provided? Not time units, but um, how many uh, researchers, how many, depends on the work. So there are two main models in the, in the US, um, new ways of working and results only work environment. And they're supposedly increasing the autonomy of the workers because you just, you just need to do your work. You have your free time. You, you are free to choose when to do it and how to do it. But you just need to do your work. And the main problem with this autonomy is that eventually uh, research sh showed that it shifts the burden on the employee uh, to organize their working day. Uh, and secondly, uh, more importantly, it doesn't bring into account all the small, tiny things that we are doing during the day. And they are not profit. And they are not products. For instance, answering emails, uh, creating a, a summary of what I was doing during, during this day. So I'm, it sounds good to talk about autonomy and to enable employees to do whatever they want to do during the working day as long as they work. But eventually, as, as, as I see it, it shifts the burden on the employees to organize the day and to do all the other stuff that are not like pure work. Okay, thank you, Tammy. Okay, thank you very much for all your questions and also thank you Marco Biasi for um, discussing our papers so also in the middle of the night in California. Um, I'm very happy about Frank's question about uh, uh, working time because I believe uh, I, I'm not the only one of course I'm building on uh, existing scholarship but there is clearly um, a connection between working time and workplace and we are observing a fragmentation of both uh, through new ways of working starting from platform work but not definitely not only there and I like to recall um, you recall the uh, CEO case of the Court of Justice but there is also another I believe interesting case which is the city D uh, Dublin um, Council case of November 2021 um, where the Court of Justice was asked to classify as either working time or rest time the period in which a worker uh, was, uh, must be available to come back to work within a few minutes, five minutes to go back to work, but still was allowed by the employer, very peculiar arrangement, let's say, he was still allowed to perform another working activity. And the question for the court was, uh, um, was that working time or resting time? 
and the answer provided by the court was in the sense of uh, resting time, even though the uh, arguments put forward were kind of problematic. But uh, I believe, um, independently of the specificities of the case, that we are more and more observing cases in which uh, employees, because there was no dispute on the classification of the, as subordinate employment in the case at hand, as employees still are uh, free to manage their working time and paradoxically to work for another employer at the same time. There is no conflict between such arrangements, at least not always a conflict between such kinds of arrangements and the uh, subordinate nature of uh, uh, the employment relationship existing with the employer. Of course, if we look at the other side of the coin, there still is the risk of uh, misclassification and uh, the, the whole uh, um, case law on platform work um, teaches us how complex it is uh, to ascertain, uh, for example, the genuine freedom of the worker to organize his or her working time and whether there is actually such a freedom or whether instead uh, uh, the employer or alleged employer uses a number of, uh, let's say, incentives or uh, yesterday I was talking to Francesca Marinelli, positive sanctions to uh, drive the um, worker to perform the activity in a certain way and in a certain time. There is uh, uh, some sort of overlapping and here I come to the observation of Professor Bellacci, which uh, um, uh, I, I believe is absolutely significant, um, also because nowadays uh, um, on the side of the employer's clear interest uh, in getting as much results as possible in the shortest period of time, uh, we also have the interest of the employee not to be um, permanently monitor and control to exercise a, a certain level of autonomy in organizing the working time. And I refer, I uh, like to refer to a proposal made by a colleague of mine in a recent essay. Unfortunately, it's an Italian, um, uh, an essay published uh, a few months ago, uh, where he suggested, um, and I believe at least it's a, an interesting way of looking at it to use working hours as some sort of conventional way to determine um, re uh, remuneration, but not necessarily as um, a way to calculate working time. Meaning that I can have an arrangement with the, my employer according to which I am paid 40 hours per week, but I am still free to manage my working time. Basically looking at uh, working hours and some sort of conventional currency just to determine remuneration, but not to determine working time. Can it might author, be a can, you name, can you say the name of uh, the author? Uh, the Maurizio Del Conte is also a professor at Bocconi University. We, we work together there. And um, I thought it was uh, some sort of futuristic way to separate remuneration from working time, uh, which could be maybe a way to also uh, overcome uh, this tendency to go back to piece of work, as Professor Bellace put it. And coming to the final uh, million dollar question of Maike, thank you for your question. Uh, do I believe, do we have a right to work from home? I know I might be um, not following the mainstream, but I believe no, at least not always. Uh, because still the employer um, is the head of the business and is taking the responsibility to organize the business in order to obtain a certain economic result. Um, and this is still the main purpose of enterprises. Therefore, if the employer has the responsibility to manage the, the, the business, uh, it must also uh, requires people to come to work if it's necessary. Therefore, a spread undetermined right to work from home, I believe, is not feasible. Of course, we can definitely extend or rethink um, current situation in which there is a right to work from home, not only, for example, to motherhood or parental leaves, but also to broader situation. Definitely, yes. But I'm not sure if I will definitely go for a general right to work from home uh, in any case, in any situation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, finally, um, Fuzini. Yes, thank you very much for all um, 
uh, questions, observations, and thank you, Marco, for your comments. I would like just to briefly um, <clears throat> explain my idea of a human-centered approach uh, as I oppose it to the um, resources-centered approach, which has been followed in the economic recovery after the financial crisis. And this is what I want to highlight um, at this point, that the uh, corona pandemic deserves a human-centered approach instead of a resources-centered one. Um, and thank you very much. I will develop further this uh, idea and uh, uh, explain my arguments. Um, first of all, um, regarding the working time question um, uh, during telework, um, indeed it is difficult to measure and record the working time. There have been different uh, practices we have observed in different countries and so on. Uh, um, trusted time sometimes was um, uh, established for measuring working time. But in my opinion, it would be necessary to um, link uh, this topic with the right to disconnect. And that would be um, like my proposal uh, for a strong right to disconnect um, uh, and make a separation between a working time and a private time. Uh, but this right to disconnect is not only um, enough to be adopted, it has also be enforced. So the um, uh, institutions and the um, instruments should be in place for the enforcement of such a right. Uh, the, observe, the, the comment on the business model changes, I believe from, CV, from, Sil, from Silvia Lairone, it was very, a very good point. Because actually, um, we see how globalized the economy is. We see how interdependent um, um, the um, labor markets are uh, in this global context. So we see it not only due to the pandemic, we see it now with the geopolitical tensions uh, in uh, Ukraine. And uh, I personally believe indeed that this puts pressure on working conditions. It will put, put pressure on working conditions. Um, however, this, as it, this is a very, a very national um, issue. Um, it, 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 it fits indeed with the national uh, legislation, but there are difficulties when transnational relationships uh, arise. And this, there may be a gap there that needs to be um, addressed, of course, at the European le uh, Union level or maybe bilaterally or um, with other solutions. Um, okay. The, uh, just a, a last comment maybe to the um, advocate for a right to work uh, from home. Uh, in Germany, I want to uh, mention that um, uh, this right has been uh, pushed for many months now or years, but it's not uh, been adopted yet. So um, Germany wanted to have a right to a um, home office of 24 days per year. But uh, this uh, is not uh, uh, realized yet. Uh, in my opinion, it is necessary to have flexible working arrangements. But we saw in uh, the presentation of Elena and David how hesitant uh, employers are in this respect. Um, and uh, maybe last uh, last comment on the um, on the going backwards uh, regarding uh, hourly work and um, uh, peace work. Uh, in my opinion, we need to act at this point, um, and um, we need to highlight this. It's very important. Uh, trade unions are not in all our countries very active. In Greece, they are uh, almost absent, and they, in Germany, they are of course more active. But um, this is a, a big necessity. And uh, we saw also in the pandemic that uh, we had um, new uh, psychosocial risks emerging um, in the workplace and in the teleworking work workplace, burnout syndromes and so on. These have to be addressed and this, I think, we need to act and it should not be left to um, uh, self-regulation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for with this comment. I think uh, we have a fa uh, nice final word for this session and uh, we have to thank our uh, three presenters and uh, the discussant for stimulating uh, thoughts uh, on the topic that of course uh, will uh, continue uh, in the future.
All right. Thank you very much. Thank you also for the audience for the questions and the questions.